Bibles with me to Romans chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand so we can get one to you. We're going to be doing a Bible study going through the whole chapter. So raise your hand if you don't have a Bible, and we will get you one. She's good. Yeah. She's doing very well. Smallest baby yet. Seven pounds, six ounces. The one before this was almost 10 pounds. So mom was praying and fasting for a smaller baby, and the Lord answered her prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for tonight. Father God, we thank you so much for this family that you've given us to be a part of that we can bear each other's burdens, we can rejoice, we can weep, we can seek you for each other. Lord, it's such a blessing that you haven't called us to be alone. Lord, I feel so sorry for those people who think that they can just call themselves Christian and, and just walk through life without any real fellowship in the body of Christ. Such a privilege, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you for this body that you've given us at Calvary Chapel Spring Valley. We thank you for the work that you're so faithful to bring to completion that you've started. And we're also so grateful that you allow us to be a part of it. Lord, thank you for your word. We pray that you would minister to us tonight and that we in turn would respond by worshiping you in obedience. We love you, Father God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 14 is a great chapter. It is the sister chapter, so to speak, of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which talks about the same thing. But I, you know, it's two different Bible studies, kind of, but they're talking about the same thing. So I wanted to focus on Romans chapter 14 because of the direction Paul goes when he's talking to the Romans. And, you know, we're going to be considering um, freedoms that we have in Christ. What, what are we not free to do? We are not free to sin, but we are free to have preferences. And we'll talk about that tonight, and we'll look at what the Word says. Let's start in chapter 14, verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may, he may eat all things, but he who is weak only eats vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat Judge him who eats, for God has received him. When I read these verses and I think about people, when I think about the church, when I think about the body of Christ, you know, it's a broad spectrum. You have all kinds of different types of people with different kinds of tastes, and they're geared differently, and you have men, and you have women, and you have young, and and it's a wonderful picture when we think about what God has given us in this family that we have, right? It's very cool. We also, I think, need to consider that not only do we have this body, the church, that represents God on earth, but we're not all on the same level. And what I mean by that is not a level hierarchically. What I mean is a process that we've talked about before called this process of sanctification. And we're all at different levels or at different points in that process. Sometimes we think that we have the freedom to do things, and because we have a freedom to do something, others should too. That's what Paul's going to talk about. He's going to say, listen, just because you have that freedom, would you exercise it in front of a brother or sister who doesn't therefore stumble them? You shouldn't do that. I think of the family dynamic. It's something we can all relate to because no matter who you are, you've always had a family. And if, you know, if by some reason you were in an orphanage or you had, you know, foster parents, you still had some kind of earthly family. And you had some kind of dynamic in the way that family worked, right? You have the little babies. And when the little babies are small, uh, they're drinking milk and, you know, (laughs) they're drinking milk and you don't say to a baby, hey, baby, wake up. You should be eating steaks with us. You know, you don't, you don't instruct the baby in its, in the stage that it's in to be in a stage that it's not. 
And then when it's time to potty train, you don't focus on, you know, getting the permit so they can drive the car. You focus on potty training. There's a stage that they're in, and there's a stage that we need to help them get through, right? And when, you're, when you have teenagers, <laughs> when you have teenagers, you know, you're, you're almost like, hey, come on, grow up. But it's not time for them to grow up. They're teenagers, and you're teaching them what it's like to be a, an adult or what it's going to be like to be an adult. You don't expect them at any point to be at a stage that they're not in. And we have to remember that as Christians too. There's baby Christians, there's diaper training Christians, they make a big mess, and there's there's, you know, teenage Christians and, you know, mature adult Christians. So when we come to church and we have this interaction with brothers and sisters that we love, we have to take into consideration that point or that level or that stage that they are in and help, help them, encourage them, bless them. And I'm glad that you are all mature believers here tonight. I can tell by looking at you. So this is more of an exhortation for you. Change some diapers. Help these young Christians out who need you to help train them up, discipling them, right? Isn't that what we're called to do anyway? We're called to disciple, and we can't lose focus of that. And I think that's the heart of what um, Paul is talking about here. When my kids were infants, you know, as a joke, you know, even the new baby, I've done it a couple times. It's, I'm a corny, I'm really corny, sorry. So, when, you know, as a joke, when the baby would start crying, there's these little infants, I'd say, hey, i yell at them, hey, don't be a baby. And, you know, my kids thought it was hilarious. And then, you know, you know, one of them says, but dad, he is a baby. Oh, yeah, I forgot he is a baby. So, again, let's focus on what stage they're in and not get away from how we can assist and help them, considering them and discipling them. In verse 2, it says, For one believes he may, he, he may, one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak only eats vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not, let him who not, who does not, eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Every facet, every level, God has received that person, no matter what they're going through, what level of maturity they're at, God has received them. Number four, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Isn't that a good verse? Let me read that one again. Who are you to judge another's servant? These people aren't servants of us. These are not people that are accountable to me. These are brothers and sisters and children of God that are accountable to him. There's never a point that I'm going to be accountable for the decisions that you make. Unless I'm a teacher behind the pulpit telling you to do bad things, then I'm going to be held accountable for that. But you as an individual make decisions that you are going to be held accountable for. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. So there comes a point also where it's not time to let that person go to the next stage, right? It's, it's to reiterate the basics. Listen, you should be uh, eating solid food, or I fed you with milk, not with solid food, because up until now, you couldn't receive it. There's going to come a point spiritually when you have a level of maturity spiritually that you're going to be able to process things that are beyond milk, that are beyond just the simple things of the gospel. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died and was buried for your sins, and he was raised for everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's milk. It's very simple. Children can understand that, respond, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Then we start getting into the Bible, and there's things that are a little more meaty. 
There's things that need some consideration and somebody that has a little bit more maturity in their walk with the Lord. And Paul says, I didn't take you to that next level because you weren't ready yet. And he talks a little bit more about that in Hebrews also, but I just bring that up to say there is a time. There is a time to wait in the stage that we're at spiritually, maturity-wise. And there's a time to move on. There's a time to remind people that they need to be progressing. I can't help but think about the, the articles a couple last year, year and a half, two years ago. It was very... Um, it was very much a hot topic of how there was these mothers who were breastfeeding their kids up until, you know, four, five, six, seven. There was a very controversial picture of a woman standing with her blouse pulled up and a child that was about six or seven years old that was still nursing. And it was, it, it was a controversy, you know, like you shouldn't do that. Well, I'm not here to address that tonight. All I'm saying is there is a natural process to where a child is weaned and moves on to solid food, regardless of the connection to the mother. I don't want to offend anybody tonight or anything. I'm just using it as an illustration for what we're talking about. Let's move on to uh, verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observed the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he does not eat to the Lord. And he who does not eat to the Lord, to the Lord he does not eat, in giving God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. I, I, um, in Croatia, we had the, the church, and we were getting ready to transition into a new building uh, for the church, and um, we were having a little bit of trouble finding a place because as soon as people found out that we were Christians and that we were um, born-again Christians and not Catholics, they wouldn't rent a place to us. In fact, we've been in situations where we would move into a place, we'd sign the contract, and then after our first Sunday service, the landlord would come back and say, hey, we changed our mind, we don't want you in here, you're bad for our rep, and ripped up the contract and kicked us out. And, you know, we couldn't do anything about it because we're in a country where we're the foreigner. You know, we are the people who... Um, are to the, at the mercy of the laws of the land. So there wasn't anything we could really do. We just, we had to go with it. So we found down in the city center this uh, Seventh-day Adventist church, and you guys know the Seventh-day Adventists, they believe that they are supposed to worship on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, okay? This is a perfect example of what Paul's talking about. And because they worship on the Sabbath, and we had our services on Sunday, it worked out really well. So, you know, I, I approach this guy, and I'm talking to him, and he's very, very nice. He's not, you know, disrespectful. We have different viewpoints theologically, but he looks at it as an opportunity for his church to help pay for rent, and we look at it as an opportunity to use a building that's already set up like a church, and we don't have to worry about getting kicked out anytime soon. So, long story short, we didn't end up going into that building, but the relationship that we had, myself and that pastor and other situations also, was a, was a good relationship. Again, like, I'm not going to get into the theological differences, but just because they held one day as more important than another didn't mean that we could still be brothers and talk about things as brothers, right? The same goes with holidays. I'm not a big holiday guy. That's just how I am. You know, I'm not a big, big lots of party action holiday. I like to hang at home with my family, and, you know, that, that's, that's what's important to me. So we would have these holidays come. We're living in Croatia, right? And I'm using this as an example because it does make a little bit more sense. We're living in Croatia, and we have the opportunity to celebrate American holidays. And for me, it was like, I don't, I don't care, you know. It's great that it's Thanksgiving. I'm thankful that I'm with my family. But, you know, do we throw a big party as a church because there's some Americans in the church who are American and want to celebrate Thanksgiving? Well, you know, I 
didn't mind, but some of the ladies, you know, they really liked their Thanksgiving, and, th you know, they wanted to do it, so we did it. But for me, you know, it didn't matter. We can bring up some other holidays, too, even for us. Like, there's some controversy around um, Halloween, right? There's some controversy as believers for Christmas, too. Should we be observing Christmas? Should we not? And the focus is not uh, on the day. It's about Jesus. It's very simple for us to say, this isn't about Santa Claus. <laughs> for us, it should never be about presents or Santa Claus. It's about Jesus Christ. So, Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. Everything that we do needs to be as unto the Lord anyway. There's nothing that we're going to do that we should be doing for ourselves. And if we are doing it for ourselves, then that's where it becomes a problem. At any point when we start to live for ourselves, that's when the red light should come on. What's motivating me to do this thing? What's motivating me to be a vegetarian or to have freedom to eat meat or to observe this day as better than that day or that day better than this day? Do I do all these things as unto the Lord? Am I living for God or am I just living for myself to have a feast on Thanksgiving? I like feasts and eating, but even when I do it, I need to do it unto the Lord. Now, this is the point where we need to make a distinction because there is... Um, Two things. The first thing he says is, uh, let each be, in verse, second part of verse 5, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So there needs to be a conscious convincing of your, your own conscious being convinced that what you're doing, you're doing as unto the Lord. Now, there's a difference between being convicted that you have the freedom to do something and doing something because you want to do something which is sin right? So the difference between sinning and having a conviction about something is whether I am doing it as to please the Lord or bless the Lord or having a certain freedom, but at the point that it becomes sin, then that separates me from my relationship with God. I guess I think of it like this. Um, my wife and I like all kinds of food. I like fish, she doesn't like fish. She allows me to eat fish because she loves me, and it's not really a big deal to her. But I can't go out on the town running around cheating on her. Because that would inhibit our relationship. The co covenant of marriage that I've made with my wife, we've agreed on, we have a, a special type of relationship that I can't have with anybody else, nor do I want to. But that's what marriage is. Me having fish doesn't separate us in our relationship. It doesn't hinder us in living and functioning together, right? We might like different types of toothpaste, but it's not sin. It's just a different preference. And that's the difference that Paul's making here. He's saying, listen, there could be a conviction that you have, but be sure that you are fully convinced that it's your conviction from the Lord. Not that it's something that you want to do to justify your lifestyle. Not that it's something that you can continue to do if it's sin, because it's something that you want to do. Look at verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, and he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is, writ for it is written, <clears throat> As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So there's two different types of things we're talking about here. The first thing is, I need to be convinced that I have this freedom and that it's not sin. It's me doing something before God, and it's a, a preference that I have that's okay, and again, that it's not sin. And then, the freedoms that I have, the preferences that I do take, aren't going to put a stumbling block for my brothers or sisters. 
It's I'm going to focus on helping them and building them up rather than me having freedom to do whatever I want. I have this, uh, what I like to call the Harley mindset theology. Anybody knows what a Harley is here? I like Harleys. They're cool. But I can't have one because for me, a Harley is something that I would justify myself to have for my own pleasure. I know many brothers in this church that have Harleys and motorcycles, and the Lord has given them this opportunity to have a Harley because it's what he's blessed them with. They have a freedom to do that, and their hearts are in the right place. If I got a Harley, and you know, that prayer may have been said, Lord, it's me, Tim. Just think if I had a Harley. Just think of all the people that could get saved. You know, me on my Harley, cruising down the street, people saying, whoa, look at that guy. He's on a Harley. And then I can share the gospel with them, and they could respond, and then it will be good for you for me to have a Harley. Does that sound like the right heart? No matter how I want to twist it or change it, I know that for me, my preference, I can't. And I'm not at all saying that nobody else can. All I'm saying is, for me, I'm fully convinced that I can't spend the money on that bike because God hasn't given me the freedom to. So then, each of us shall account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, to put a stumbling, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Instead of focusing on what our freedoms are, instead of focusing on what we can do because our sins have been forgiven and we have reconciliation to God, let's focus on how we can bless others in the body of Christ. If I know that something that I have a freedom in causes my brother to stumble, he says, resolve this. It's kind of timely, isn't it? Because we're getting to the new year. It's almost, you know, it's going to be the new year's resolution. And we can resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in my brother's way. I can decide, you can decide, that the freedoms that you have, you don't have to exercise in front of people that are going to be offended by it, and their walk with the Lord is going to be stumbled. Look at verse 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. There's no way that we can say, hey, listen, this is unclean, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have freedom in Christ, because at that point it becomes sin. And you know, and I know, we know those things in our lives as individuals, as people, those things that we can't do those lines that we can't cross. Now, I don't want to, you know, bring up anything that's going to be too controversial, but there's a lot of talk, you know, about uh, wine as well and, and alcoholic drinks. Some of you guys know that you can't do it. You know, I in my past had a, had a history with alcohol. Derek, Pastor Derek has expressed too from the pulpit that you know, he knows that him, by him doing that, he knows his flesh, and he doesn't want to give any opportunity for the flesh. There are some people that have that freedom. And we live in an American culture that has a different view of alcohol than the rest of the world has. I know pastors in, in different countries that come together for pastors' conferences, and they sit down and have a beer together, and that's it. For many people here, that's shocking. Like, what? If you're a pastor, you cannot have a beer. But for them, they have a freedom, and they're fully assured of that. If any of them do it, though, knowing that they shouldn't, then it becomes sin. Their relationship with with God is hindered, and that's the furthest thing, that's the, the last thing that we want to happen. We need to focus and realize that as we continue to walk with the Lord, as we continue to serve God, our desire is to be as close to Him as possible. We're learning who He is. He's revealing Himself to us. We don't want to put anything in front of us that's going to affect that relationship that we have with God or that will take away any part of that relationship that we have with Him. 
So if we don't want to do that for, our, for ourselves, how much more should we not want to do it for our brothers and sisters? Verse 15, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. If I have a brother who doesn't eat meat, and he knows that I'm okay with eating meat, and we go out to eat somewhere that serves meat and vegetables. He orders a vegetable plate. Do you think that he should expect me to order a vegetable plate also? I don't think so. I think if he's a strong believer, if he's a mature believer, and he has a certain conviction about something, he can respect the fact that I'm going to get something that's meat. What if I took it to the next level? What if I said, you know, I'm going to teach this guy a lesson? He needs to have freedom like I got freedom. What's wrong with him anyway? Who's going to eat broccoli for dinner? That doesn't even make any sense. So I'm going to get the biggest, fattest T-bone steak I can get. And I'm not even using silverware tonight. When that food comes, I'm going to look him straight in the eye. I'm going to pick up that baby, and I'm just going to go to turn and rip it. I'm going to say, you know what? Make it rare. Make it rare. So the blood is squirting everywhere. And so that this guy gets the point, I can do whatever I want in Christ. Now, have I put a stumbling block in front of my brother? Maybe he would give me the option of functioning in my own convictions. But at the point where I start putting in his face and telling him I can do something and he can't, I'm causing him to stumble. That's my brother. You know, Paul says, we're going to turn there and look at it, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. And I think what Paul's saying is, if I'm at the restaurant, we're sitting down, he orders vegetables, Paul says, I order vegetables for the night. What's a salad for dinner? No big deal, who cares? But I don't want anything at all during that dinner to hurt my brother's faith. Paul was very serious, I think, about it. And sometimes I think about it, too, and I, that's how I want to respond to you guys. That's how I want to bless you and encourage you in your faith. We're different people going through different things, and we need to learn to work together and function as a family. This whole vegetarian thing is, is, is something that has gotten to be more popular now, too. You have vegans and vegetarians, and the, the debate has kind of, you know, gotten stoked there's a verse in Genesis chapter 9, the first five verses, it talks about how uh, it seems that mankind, humankind, didn't even eat meat until after the flood. That was a long time. You know, and the vegetarians and vegans will say, look at that, Genesis chapter 9, they weren't even eating meat, and neither should you. But they're not, you know, they shouldn't use that as a focus to make their non-meat meat. Can we use meat eaters and, and vegetarians or carnivores and herbivores? Yeah, omnivores. Sorry. But it goes both ways. The focus should be, listen, you guys know each other. I see the same faces here every Saturday night. The focus should be on loving each other. And I know you guys are doing this, but I just want to exhort you to do it more. I want you to think about it. Think about what freedoms that you have. Think about how you respond to people who have different freedoms. Some people have the possibility before God to wear certain clothes. Some people don't. But you need to consider that some people can't handle you wearing those certain kinds of clothes. So don't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. And this goes across the board. This is not one thing this is many things. The whole sphere of our lives and all the choices and decisions that we make. Verse 15, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, <coughs> you are no longer walking in love. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. <laughs> doesn't get any more serious than that. Don't use your freedom 
of whatever kind of food you want to eat to destroy somebody that Jesus died on the cross for. That will ring your bell, won't it? But we still make judgments about people. We still say things that they should or shouldn't be doing. And we haven't considered what stage they're at spiritually. We haven't considered what convictions they have freedom to function in. And we need to stop and consider it because we can't destroy those who are Christ's bride because of our freedoms. Verse 16, Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. This conversation that we're having right now about it is not the focus, right? The focus is we've received righteousness through Jesus Christ. The focus is we've received peace through his sacrifice so that we don't have to fear the consequences of sin anymore. We get to live eternally. That's the focus. All of those things are just a byproduct. They're extras. The food we get to eat and the drinks we get to drink and the things that we get to do on earth. It's life. Verse 18, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. There's three things in that verse that I want to focus on. Therefore, let us pursue. When he says pursue something, what do you think he means? Meander? You think he means like, you know, think about doing? To pursue is active. It's to pursue. When was the last time you actively thought about how you could bless somebody? For no reason at all, for grace. In fact, let's, let's talk about that person that's a vegetarian that you don't like because they flaunt their freedom. Or that person who does that other thing that you don't like because they're convicted they can and you're convicted they're not. When is the last time you pursued them not to show them the freedoms that you have, but to show them the love that God gave you through his son Jesus Christ? The second thing is peace. There will be strife. As soon as I start pointing at people and telling them what they can and can't do, there's no peace left in that relationship. There's not a, it's not conducive for having a healthy relationship. So you want that peace. You have to pursue those people. And then the next thing by which we may edify one another. That word edify means to build up. So you see somebody with a level of faith. You see somebody at a certain stage in their spiritual development, and you can identify. You say, this person is a weak brother or sister. And not in pride, not in pride. This person is a baby in Jesus Christ. How can I build them up? They say that, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they say when, when a children are, are starting to walk, but when they're still infants and they're not ready for that next stage, if you try to help them walk, it's bad for their hips and their legs, and you shouldn't. You should wait till the point where they themselves have pulled themselves up. They're trying to take steps, and then you can try to assist them and help them. Identify those Christians that are at that stage. Hold their hands. Help them walk. Share a point in your life, in your faith, that you are at the same point. Not in a condescending way, but just say, hey, listen, at this point in my life, this is the stuff I was going through. You can recognize that they're going through the same things, but you don't have to say that. And then that will encourage them in, in that stage of faith that they're in right there. And then verse 20 20, again, is another strong exhortation to us. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Do not destroy the work of God. God's been building you up. He's building other people up, too. You see yourself growing. There's people around you that are growing. 
God is building them up. We can help build each other up. Don't come in and hinder that process. Not only stop it, not only stop the process from progressing, but knock down how far they've come to the point where they're struggling in their faith. They don't know what they have freedom to do and what they don't have freedom to do. And I've seen personally Christians come away from the church saying, we feel judged, we feel like we can't do this, we can't do that, we feel like this is what happened. And then they get bitter because of the people in the church and they start to reject God. And I would try to tell them, listen, this isn't about God. This isn't them rightfully representing God. This is them wrongly representing who God is. And you need to realize that your first priority is to get right with him. But stop, don't look at the people. Those people who were immature or who were putting stumbling blocks in front of young believers that hindered and made their faith very difficult. second part of verse 20, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now there's some things that you guys do have freedom to do, you know, and that's good. There's some things that you don't. That's good too. But in considering what other people's are, the focus, like it says here in that verse, is to do whatever you can to not make them stumble. I know I'm I'm, um, repeating myself, but I'm actually, actually the Bible's repeating itself. This is something that we need drilled into our heads. We need to consider again and again. Do you have faith? Verse 22. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. I'm not talking about, you know, and the Bible's not talking about being a closet drunk because that's sin. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he who does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, he focuses the attention again back to us as the believer in the end. He focuses back on us again and says, what is your freedom? And are you sure of it? Do you have any doubts? If you do have a doubt, if you're condemned to eat, then don't do it anymore. Just make sure that you're well assured in your own faith what God has given you the ability to do and what he has not given you the ability to do. Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. And he is continuing to go on from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, talking more about this issue that they had, which was eating meat sacrificed to idols. In verse 23, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are edifying. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and, the, and its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience' sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for, for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. So Paul's given an example here, which, you know, we need to talk a little bit about what he's talking about. He's talking about food sacrificed to idols. Back then, they had temples. And just like the Jews had sacrifices to God on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, these other cultures and cities had their own gods, which were not real gods. They were made-up gods. And they would have sacrifices made to their gods. And because the meat was sacrificed to the god, they had stuff left over, some of the meat. 
So what they would do is they'd take that meat into the marketplace and they would sell it. Some commentators believe, and they say they can prove as well, they sold it for cheaper. They sold it for less money because it was offered to an idol and they could get a better deal for it. Well, part of the issue was for these Christians in Corinth was that some people had the freedom to, let's say, spend less money on the meat that was sacrificed to idols. But some said, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that because that meat was sacrificed to an idol. And we don't worship idols. We worship God. Paul responds by saying, hey, listen, there is no God but one God. So they can offer to idols all day long. They're honoring a false god. So eat the meat. It's cheap. Are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it to the glory of God? Are you thanking God for his provision for you in your life? Then eat it. And he says, hey, listen, if it's a question, don't ask any questions. So that your conscience, your conscience doesn't get assaulted. If there's a question, hey, there's a nice steak there. That thing's big and juicy, but... If it's sacrificed to an idol, if, you know, I'm, I'm going to be offended. I'm going to be stumbled. Well, if that's the case, then don't ask. Just eat it. <laughs> then you'll never know. The same applies to us and everything that we do. You think about the stuff that we do in today's society, in today's culture. Some people have freedom to watch movies that are questionable. Just remember, do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever... Uh, man sows, that's what he'll also reap. Garbage in, garbage out. You can watch that stuff and think that it's okay, but the reality is it comes back out, and it starts in your head. Let's just cuss words. I'll just, you know, I'll just ignore it. Next thing you know, somebody cuts you off, and you bleep at them, and you're like, oh, where did that come from? Well, you've been watching that movie. What do you expect? You know, it's being ingrained into your head. Don't be surprised. So that's just a warning. There are things that have negative consequences because we just shouldn't do it. There's other things that we have freedom to do, you know, that we can as long as it isn't hindering our conscience. And then there's some of you maybe here sitting here tonight and you're thinking like, what are you talking about? You're talking about conscience and sin and conviction and I don't even know what you're talking about. Let me, let me say this. The sin issue is such a big deal because we were separated from God. We did not have true fellowship with him. We couldn't know who he was because we were separated from him. And God gives us the opportunity through his son, Jesus Christ, to receive reconciliation in that relationship to God so that we can know him. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the main thing is Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Not so that you can live forever, okay? Not just so you can live forever, but so that you could know who God is and live forever. What's the point of living forever if you don't know the person that created you or gave you the ability to live forever? If you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Who cares? If I'm going to be alone in the universe, spinning out of control forever, without any kind of understanding of why I'm there, that would be miserable. That would be hell. But God gives us reconciliation to himself so that we can live with him. And as we live, listen, we have normal lives. We have, we have husbands and wives. We have kids. We have moms and dads, brothers and sisters. We have brothers and sisters in the church. We, we have lives. And how we express ourselves through life, we want to be a representation, representation of who God is in our lives. That's what we're really talking about. So if there's somebody here who hasn't made that confession of faith, if there's somebody here who hasn't received Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you that this is the time to do that. This is a time to have reconciliation to God. This is a time where you can not only live forever because of repentance of sins, but that you can know who God is. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for the freedom you give us, that we're not held in bondage under the law. We don't have to live according to the law in the Old Testament. You've separated our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, we thank you so much for it. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful 
that you've cleansed us. You've adopted us. You call us sons and daughters. And you give us opportunity to display that love back onto each other. We have this family, Lord, that we can encourage, that we can build up, that we can bless, that we can help, that we can disciple. And Lord, we want to. Thank you for your word tonight, Lord. We pray that you would root it deep into our hearts and allow us to apply it this week in loving our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give us a moment right now. I mentioned, you know, there could possibly be somebody who here who hasn't taken that step, has not confessed that they need Jesus, that they repented of their sins, and that they desire to have reconciliation to God. So as we're all in an attitude of prayer, if you guys can bow your heads and close your eyes and just ask God for those people right now. If there's anybody here at all who wants to take that step to make that decision to ask for forgiveness of sins, to say, I didn't know what the difference was between conviction and sin. I didn't know that I was pushing myself further from God because of the lifestyle that I was justifying myself to live in. And now you know. And now you don't want to continue to live for yourself because you understand and realize that nothing is coming from it. You're not really getting the things that you want. You're getting things that you want and you're finding that you want more. Well, that space that you're trying to fill with everything else in the world is never going to be truly filled until you surrender your heart to God and have reconciliation to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. So if there's anybody here tonight that wants to take that step, I want to pray for you. So go ahead and raise your hand, stretch it up nice and high so that I can pray for you and we can recognize together tonight as a family that we want to be there with you, bless you, support you, and help you as you start to receive milk and follow Jesus. Let's give you a minute while Tony plays to go ahead and raise your hand so that you can make that confession. Anybody at all? Let's pray. Father God, again, Lord, we, we, we love you. We thank you. I thank you so much for the family that you've given us. For, for my wife, for Grace and I, just these people that have, have invested in us and loved us and, and allowed us to be part of their lives, Lord, so that we can grow up together, so that we can look at each other as bro truly brothers and sisters who are growing and maturing and changing and being made to be conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would be blessed tonight. Ask that you would help us identify those things that we have, that we can have freedom in. And Lord, bring those things out in us that we shouldn't be doing so that we can repent and follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.